Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Silent Hill 3 is the third instalment into the Silent Hill franchise and a direct sequel to the story of the first Silent Hill game. Released by Konami on May 23rd of 2003 in Europe, this game is now 20 years old. In this video, we'll be examining the key elements of the game in full and asking if it still holds up two decades later. I will cover everything from its early development to its story and gameplay elements. So sit back and relax as we take a look at Silent Hill 3. Oh, and uh, spoilers ahead. Team Silent was a development team within Konami who were responsible for the first four Silent Hill games from 1999 to 2004. The development of the first Silent Hill mainly focused on creating an impressive game engine and world that players could explore, which is why many plot points of the first game somewhat miss the mark or feel empty. That said, its key themes, including the occult references and symbolism, an incredible world, were praised by critics and survival horror fans. Silent Hill was a success, and players wanted more. Following this success, Team Silent wanted to go further, as their previous ambitions were quite limited by the hardware of 1999. With the release of the PlayStation 2, the team were now able to develop a title that pushed new boundaries, but this time with a larger budget targets and team. The team itself had expanded from its original 15 members responsible for the first game to over 50 for Silent Hill 2. Members of this team, both new and returning, had contributed ideas and themes for Silent Hill 2's new story, which aimed to be psychologically deep. They already had the world designed and key themes established thanks to the first game. Now, they were also able to fully focus on developing its story, one that the team could call their Silent Hill. The problem with this approach is that it neglects everything from the first game, including its story, flaws and all. Those plot points that missed the mark were never developed or explained further in the second game, something that fans at the time, especially in Japan, were craving. Players of Silent Hill 2 were confused. Why did they have to change the story entirely? Why were the occult elements of the first game missing, and instead, why are we playing a psychological tale of someone who we just don't know? Although Silent Hill 2 is now considered a classic by today's standards, this wasn't the case upon its release. Following the initial negative reaction to Silent Hill 2, Team Silent would go on to develop a third and fourth game around the same time. Team Silent had essentially been split down the middle to work on both the third and fourth installments. These smaller teams could work more intimately and decide on their source of inspiration a lot more clearly. Silent Hill 2 took inspiration from various themes and input from the entire team. However, Silent Hill 3 would take a step back, to its roots. And so, Silent Hill 3 would pick up where the first game had left off, giving fans what they had been asking for whilst also returning to the original occult themes. The key gaps of Silent Hill's story centred around Harry's newly adopted daughter, who he escaped at the end of the game with. This child is the reincarnation of his previous daughter Cheryl, who he lost in Silent Hill, and Alessa Gillespie, a victim of the evil cult in the town. Most importantly though, this child will be our main protagonist of Silent Hill 3. To say that there were challenges during the development of the third Silent Hill is an understatement. A bulk of development time for Silent Hill 3 was actually spent on developing a rail shooter, a popular genre of games at the time, especially in Japan. Following the reaction of Silent Hill 2 and rather underwhelming sales, Team Silent intended on creating something that would simply hit targets. But, as we now know, hunting for sales never sits right with long-time fans, who just want their story. Quite some time into development, Team Silent realised a rail shooter isn't the direction the series should go, and that work was scrapped entirely. Members of the team, both new and old, agreed that the narrative of the project must stay true to the nature of the first game, and this is where the team would begin developing the Silent Hill 3 story we are familiar with today. So, with an idea for a story underway, it was time to get innovative with the game's programming elements. Previous titles would have used full motion video or FMVs to create a stunning experience whilst playing the game. This achieved a movie-like experience which was a goal for Silent Hill 2. However, for Silent Hill 3, 
The team's new ambition was to create a world so stunning and detailed that there was no need to rely on a pre-recorded video file. Real-time effects would be used to fully immerse the player throughout the game's narration. This innovative work ranges from the facial and object animation to the single falling raindrops and narrowly casted shadows. And this wasn't the only programming innovation from Silent Hill 3 that would immerse the players. This game featured multiple moving texture layers, something we simply hadn't seen before, which allowed for two or more textures to animate on top of each other simultaneously. We can find this in the bleeding walls, the red infecting mirror room, or memory of a lesser monster, all of which are in the other world. Another immersion is through combat vibrations, which are used when a player is near enemies, specific objects or areas, or they're hurt. What's more, is these vibrations are configured with the game so that specific enemies, objects, areas, or health can request a particular controller rumble. This means that every vibration you feel as the player is different depending on where you are, what you're facing, and how safe your character is. And by today's standards, this is sort of expected, but I have to remind you, this was released 20 years ago. So aside from all of these transformational programming improvements, the game looks incredible in general. In a reactive environment with smoother and immersive animations, we find stunning textures and models for every object, character, and monster. For the characters, motion capture was used to program the character models and be used as a reference for how people actually move and engage with one another, as well as details to their character that made them seem vulnerable or more real. An example of this is in the character model's flaws, like Vincent's eyes which are purposely misaligned, or Douglas's grey patchy hair. Team Silent had made another bold decision in including just four key characters in the third game story. For comparison, Silent Hill had seven characters and Silent Hill 2 had five. The lead character of Silent Hill 3 would be Heather Mason, a 17-year-old girl who wears this practical white jacket, selected for its standout design in an otherwise murky environment. She also wears a skirt to accentuate her femininity, and accessories that complement the surrounding environments, red and orange tones. Heather was originally supposed to be named Helen, after her first design was an older woman. This was swiftly thrown in the bin, and we were instead given Heather. Aside from her actual design, Heather is a standout character for her instant relatability. She is arguably the most human of all the Silent Hill protagonists, as we have all experienced the angst of being a teenager in a world that is seemingly against you. Obviously, Heather's world is a lot more brutal than anything that we can experience. Heather handles most situations with a passive and disinterested attitude, almost like she can't be bothered at times, especially when she's in the presence of someone or something else. Is that it for the message? Uh-huh. Thanks. She does become more vulnerable when by herself, or talking over the phone, however. This clever illustration of her character emphasises one part of being a teenager, being self-critical and emotionally hiding from others. This is also written in her character, with various unbothered lines as she is in the face of something horrific like a monster. You? Death to all who turn their backs on God! Is every person here a mental case? But when she is alone, she often looks and says things that reveal her very thoughts, with one moment at the end really revealing her breaking point. Is that the end? Dad. <laughs> Dad. <laughs> Heather is smooth, tactical, and cool, but she is also a victim of the occult themes and personal nightmares I mentioned previously. And it's this perfect balance which makes Heather both a fun character to just play as, but also someone you can relate to. This decision to lead with a female protagonist was to keep the series fresh whilst establishing the future of Harry's daughter, which is what fans wanted. 
A fresh approach would include a more visceral nightmare, including pregnancy, stalking, murder and loss, all fears that haunt many young females. These fears were presented through its monsters which have anatomical resemblance, like the split worm or the insane cancer, which by its very name represents something unwanted and internal. The use of red isn't just to paint the hellish landscape, but its use is clearly placed when Heather is at her most vulnerable in the other world. There's a scene with a crooked hanger used to advance in a particular area of the game. The symbolism here is rather obvious. These female focused fears brought a new angle to the already established cult presence of Silent Hill. Now I'm not going to suggest that those fears were to engage a female audience, but it's instead to explore those fears more intimately and creatively. This intimate narrative of Silent Hill 3 partly paved the way for complex nuanced storytelling in the video game world. Sure this story isn't focused on psychological fears like guilt, but that doesn't mean it's less complex. In fact, I would say the symbolism and narrative within a medium that, at the time, was predominantly made for men was a bold and creative choice. This isn't to suggest that games hadn't addressed female fears or personal discoveries before by the way, but Silent Hill 3 is a title that was developed with immense care for those very personal and specific fears, and I believe that this was the fresh, new angle that Team Silent were looking to bring to the Silent Hill series. So we have had a look at the build up to Silent Hill 3, the new programming innovations and techniques, and the new protagonist and her main themes. It was now time to see what Silent Hill 3 was all about. Silent Hill 3 begins at the Lakeside Amusement Park, with Heather walking into frame as the camera pans to view various Robbie the Rabbit costumes. We find Heather has a knife, and everything feels a bit spooky. This segment is reminiscent of the first Silent Hills opening, when Harry's nightmare quickly turns for the worst, and this opening is no different, as we quickly find various monsters heading for Heather. Heather walks towards the mountain coaster ride for safety, but she is instead struck down by the ride itself. This entire segment is interesting and explores the amusement park in more detail than we saw with Harry. The fact that we open to this familiar location is a reassuring feeling for those who wanted the continuation of the first game's story. The events are also eerily similar, with Heather finding herself in this dreamlike world before being chased and then struck down, quite like Harry was in his opening scene. This event turns out to be just a nightmare, as Heather wakes up inside a Happy Burger restaurant within Central Square Mall. Now an interesting fact about this opening area, the character model we see in the corner of this first frame is just a reused model of Angela from Silent Hill 2. So there you go. Heather leaves this restaurant to call her dad and update him on her shopping experience, as we then see a strange man who is stalking Heather. This man then introduces himself as Douglas Cartland. Heather, I need to speak with you. My name is Douglas Cartland. I'm a detective. A detective? Really? Well, nice talking to you. Douglas plays a significant role in this game's story and interacts with Heather. Douglas Cartland is a private investigator hired by Claudia Wolf, a key antagonist in the game. His initial objective is to locate and bring Heather to Claudia. However, as the story progresses, Douglas becomes sympathetic towards Heather and begins to question his client's intentions. Throughout the game, Douglas provides valuable information to Heather about the mysterious occurrences in Silent Hill and the true nature of her identity. He assists her in navigating the dangerous and nightmarish environments, becoming an ally and guide during her journey. Douglas is portrayed as a seasoned and street smart detective. Although initially motivated by Claudia's instructions, he develops a sense of duty to protect Heather and aid her in unravelling the mysteries of the town. But for now, he just seems like a bit of a stalker. I feel his approach could have been a bit more calculated than this, as he eventually tells Heather that he'll wait for her outside the bathroom. Bit weird. Sorry. I'll wait here. In short, Douglas tells her that he would like to discuss her birth. I really wanted to know what Douglas would have said next, but Heather diffuses the entire conversation and leaves him waiting. Instantly we are hooked into this investigation of Heather. She's had her nightmare, and her birth is of interest to this detective. How interesting. 
In an attempt to escape the nosy detective, Heather jumps out the bathroom window and she re-enters the mall through a nearby door. Things are super quiet now and there is an obvious sense that something is wrong here as the mall is a mess. Heather enters a clothing store and finds a gun on the floor and a massive monster attacking and eating this limp body. Fun fact, this limp body is a modified model of Angela from Silent Hill 2. She really is put in work, isn't she? This monster is called a Closer. Closers move slowly, but their massive size and reach make them very dangerous. The Closer may be a manifestation of Alessa Gillespie's memories of her mother's abuse, hence the enlarged arms which resemble punching bags. Masahiro Itu designed the closer to look delicately feminine, although this is easily missed as its large stature is simply an inspiration to run the other way. Heather shoots and kills the closer with the gun she found before moving on through the back door of the store. Things have really gone tits up now as we hear the subtle movements and groans of monsters in the distance, often silenced by visiting other shops nearby. One shop being Helen's Bakery, where we find the It's Bread meme. All memes aside, Silent Hill 3 hasn't strayed away from enabling its players to interact with everything around them, even things they don't need. The main character often has humorous or obvious lines about the things that don't help, and I appreciate this being a recurring thing pointed out. It helps me to get to the right place, whilst letting me know that bread won't f help at all. Player interactions are great in this game, as there are many of these dramatic close-ups of objects of interest, like this key found underneath a pallet in the back area of the mall. Around the corner from here is a bookstore where we find our first puzzle, which is super creative and rather difficult on the higher difficulties. Go figure. This puzzle gives us a code to unlock the door at the back of the shop, which is where we first find Claudia. Claudia Wolf is the high priestess of the religious cult known as the Order in Silent Hill. Her mission is to save humanity from itself by hastening the rebirth of her cult's god in order to create paradise and begin a new world that's untainted by humans. Claudia's mission is to succeed where Dahlia Gillespie failed in Silent Hill, fueling hate into a supernaturally impregnated Heather Mason and hastening God's birth. Team Silent went through many designs for Claudia, but ultimately settled for this strange, eyebrowless woman. She also doesn't wear shoes, quite like Dahlia. Claudia was friends with Alessa Gillespie within the Order, who was eventually reincarnated as Heather. The problem for Claudia is that Heather escaped Silent Hill with Harry in the first game, leaving her with no friends. HA! This fueled some of the hatred that Claudia already had for Harry, and desire to have Alessa, her old friend and the new god with her. If you're confused about some of the things I've just mentioned regarding Claudia, the game does explain some of these factors later on. For now, what we need to know is that Claudia wants Heather to remember her past, and that her powers are needed. She then leaves Heather after giving her a massive headache. The mall has been completely swept by this other world as we see more monsters, decay, and puzzles, and Heather advances deeper in its madness. If you decide to reach into a particular toilet, you get this fun cutscene which is a callback to Silent Hill 2 and how James reaches into toilets to retrieve key items. Oh, forget it. This is way too gross. Who would even think of doing something so disgusting? The split worm concludes this Nightmare Mall segment, which is this large, uh, split worm. This is a giant purple boss which looks slimy and shiny, large and vile. This boss could represent Alessa's fear of worms, and or foreshadowing the birth of God for its vulgar imagery of an almost human-like head being pushed out. The boss itself isn't too difficult, but it is rather disgusting and so a massive step up from the monsters that we've seen so far. Defeating this boss reverts the Otherworld Mall back into the normal mall, where Heather finds Douglas and accuses him of being in on all of this with Claudia. Douglas says that he isn't on anyone's side, and asks Heather what makes her so special anyways. Heather doesn't know why she's special, but knows that she has something to do with the weirdness around her. She then says she'll take the subway home, leaving Douglas behind. The entire mall sequence is a great introduction to the key characters and elements of Silent Hill 3. 
I do want to point out here that the graphics are absolutely amazing. I was hooked when watching these scenes play out, realising that this game is 20 years old and genuinely holds up very well. Heather begins her descent underground when she enters the subway station. Here she encounters unsettling environments including bloodstains, dismembered mannequins and disturbing graffiti. The subway station reflects the typical decay and darkness associated with the Silent Hill series. Heather's journey takes her through a series of interconnected sewers. These tunnels are filled with murky water, rusted metal structures and gruesome monsters. She enters an underground passage, which serves as a transition between the sewers and the other world. This area features labyrinth-like corridors and eerie and ambient sounds, heightening the tension and sense of disorientation. The underground segments in Silent Hill 3 are designed to create a sense of unease, fear and claustrophobia. They effectively contribute to the game's psychological horror by utilising grotesque imagery, oppressive environments and disconcerting sound design. These areas also serve as a narrative backdrop, revealing more about the town's twisted history, the cult's influence and the protagonist's personal connection to Silent Hill. One of the most iconic moments of this entire sequence is the mannequin within the storage room of Hilltop Centre, accessed after the construction site. Things turn hellish once again after Heather passes out, this time I mean really weird. You can absolutely see the direction Team Silent wants it to go, with nothing subliminal here. It's an unforgettable nightmare for sure. The most notable moment of discomfort is this hanging body and seeing a photo of ourselves with the words, find the holy one, kill her? Beside this photo, an eerie note, is a room where we meet Vincent. Heather. Vincent is a young priest of the Order. Despite his position, he seems like a helping hand for us at times, although you can sense his manipulative approach to conversations. Almost like he's jokingly sympathetic, or he provides clues and answers within his brutal delivery. He says he knows all about Heather's past too, which makes him extra creepy. Shingo Yuri, the game's character designer, described Vincent as a hypocrite behind nice clothes and a neat appearance. He is rather smug and selfish, but beyond his personality, he is a mysterious character. In this particular encounter, Vincent tells Heather that he is on her side and not Claudia's, as Claudia has been totally brainwashed, and so Heather sort of half trusts him at this point. Heather continues her journey home, with significant nightmares being present after meeting Vincent. The one that stands out the most is his wheelchair behind glass. Some progress later, Heather finds herself back on the street, the normal street mind you. She eventually returns to her apartment in the town. When she enters her home, she discovers her father, Harry Mason, dead in his chair. This scene is emotionally intense and unsettling for Heather. It reveals that her father has been brutally murdered, adding a personal and tragic element to the game's storyline. The sight of her father's lifeless body creates a sense of horror and shock, further immensing the player into the psychological torment of the game. Heather's discovery of her father's death serves as a turning point in the narrative, as she becomes determined to uncover the truth behind his murder and the dark forces that have plagued her journey so far. That said, Harry's death is explained as Heather finds Claudia on the roof of their apartment. She explains that was revenge for 17 years ago. Claudia then says that she will be in Silent Hill. In the town of Silent Hill. Heather then finds Douglas back downstairs and he is sympathetic towards her. Heather says that she is going to set off to Silent Hill. Heather's voice acting in this scene is amazing, by the way. Then don't say anything. I'm fine, so 
Just get out of here and leave me alone already! Calm down. I just... Calm down? How am I supposed to do that? My father is dead! He's murdered! Get out! This is all your fault! If it weren't for you... I'm sorry. Then go! Douglas agrees to help Heather by giving her a ride to Silent Hill, and he waits outside. Heather meets him after saying her goodbyes to her father, and Douglas said he just spoke with Vincent. Vincent gave him a map and said that once they get to Silent Hill, they need to find a guy named Leonard. Heather reluctantly says that they have to take his word and trust him. Douglas also hands Heather a memo that her dad was holding onto as he died that says, To my dearest daughter. We can read this memo sometime later, and it's essentially a summary of his journey in Silent Hill, which starts with his first adopted daughter, all the way up to the struggles of raising his newly adopted daughter, Heather. It tells us who Heather is, the events that led to her existing, and how Harry saved her. This is probably one of the most important documents in the entire franchise, as it uncovers the truth of Heather's beginnings. Douglas then gives Heather a ride to Silent Hill. It's worth highlighting that we are almost two hours into this game, and we have just started to travel to Silent Hill. This is an amazing way to build up tension for the town itself. Douglas asks Heather to meet him back at this motel after she searches the hospital. I love this part of the game as we can briefly explore Silent Hill. It's eerily familiar and look, I know it's the same town as Silent Hill 2, but knowing James was here at these specific locations in his own nightmare is just unnerving. Upon entering the hospital, Heather finds herself in a dark and airy environment where the line between reality and the other world becomes even more blurred than it already was. The atmosphere is unsettling, with flickering lights, bloodstains, and a sense of decay permeating the walls. Throughout her journey in the hospital, Heather encounters various grotesque monsters that haunt the corridors. These monsters embody the nightmarish nature of Silent Hill. One significant character Heather encounters in the hospital is Stanley Coleman. Stanley is a ghostly patient who persistently leaves notes for Heather to find, yet another instance of stalking that Heather must deal with. Stanley's presence adds to the overall sense of unease and contributes to the game's exploration of personal responsibility and the dark secrets of the town. As Heather interacts with Stanley's notes, he reveals his destructive nature and attempts to manipulate her into believing that she wants him too, and is returning to Silent Hill as a saviour. This encounter serves as a psychological challenge for Heather, testing her resilience and forcing her to confront her own doubts and fears. The hospital segment in Silent Hill 3 creates a haunting and tense atmosphere, filled with disturbing monsters and psychological challenges. Stanley Coleman adds an additional layer of psychological complexity, as he embodies the struggles and twisted beliefs of the Silent Hill universe. The creepiest part is that we never actually see him, only his notes. Heather finds a phone that's ringing, and she answers it to find a man named Leonard is on the line. Leonard agrees that Claudia has gone too far, even if she is his daughter. He senses that Heather wants her dead. Leonard agrees that Claudia must be stopped, but he says that he's locked up at the end of a hall on the second floor. He urges Heather to save him by flaunting that he has a seal. I'm not sure myself, but the door is at the end of the hall on the second floor. I think I can be of help to you. I have a seal. A seal? Heading the way Leonard said, the hospital turns into a metallic labyrinth with dropping mesh gates. Heather finds a symbol, similar to the Halo of the Sun. Interacting with this plays a videotape from the first game of Lisa Garland. The tape itself shows Lisa expressing her confusion and frustration over the child in pain that just won't die. Here's a fact about that videotape, uh, Thessaly Lerner, the voice of Lisa Garland, says her voice was used without her permission here. So there you go. When the tape is actually finished, the wall the symbol was on has turned into an open corridor. The world gets particularly grim now, as Heather climbs in this room of tiles, blood and flesh. The words, what a wonderful world, are written in blood over the image of a smile. There is a vault here. 
Voltio is a creature that appears as a recurring symbol throughout Silent Hill 3. Its appearance is that of a humanoid figure, often depicted as wearing a bloodstained butcher's apron. Voltio's significance lies in its connection to the cult's rituals and the Otherworld's mechanics. Voltio is often seen performing various tasks associated with the cult's rituals, such as manipulating machinery, attending to mannequins, or performing acts of purification. It is believed to be a guardian or caretaker, overseeing and assisting in the cult's dark practices. Something interesting about the Voltio is if the player dies, there is a chance a cutscene will play where the Voltio drags Heather's body away, where he supposedly revives her as the guardian of the god Fetus although we never actually see this take place. There's also a nurse corpse in this ladder room who was meant to be modelled after Lisa Garland, but there wasn't enough time for the team to design this. Some more creepy encounters now as Heather enters the Mirror Room. The Mirror Room in Silent Hill 3 serves as a significant and introspective location, exploring themes of identity, perception, and the blurred boundaries between reality and illusion. It adds a layer of psychological depth to the game, and provides players with a unique and thought-provoking experience. As Heather navigates the mirror room, her reflections may change, distorting her appearance as it begins to be infected by these blood-soaked vines. There is also a phone call scene, where a mysterious voice wishes Heather a happy 31st birthday, the age Alyssa would be if she were still alive. He later says for her to enjoy her 24th birthday, the age that Cheryl would have been if she were still alive. This caller is never identified, and only adds to Heather's discomfort in knowing her real identity. Happy birthday, dear, who are you? Happy birthday to you. Happy 31st birthday. Is this Leonard? That's the murderer's name, not my name. I'm not your beloved Stanley, either. He's underground now. His new name is Number Seven. <laughs> but don't worry about that now. It's time to celebrate your birthday. You've got me mistaken for someone else. Today's not my... I'm not mistaken! Today is your 24th birthday, and I have a present for you. Which do you prefer? To give pain or to receive it? You can have the one you hate the most. <laughs> Happy birthday to you! <laughs> Some puzzles and troubles later, Heather ends up in a flooded basement of the Everworld Hospital. This is where she hears Leonard. The two talk and Heather realises he is just like the rest of them, as he announces he is too a follower of the Order. Leonard reveals himself from the water, and turns out to be this large reptilian beast. Now, this might reinforce the idea that what you see in Silent Hill is different than reality, as no reptilian like this would ever sound as human as Leonard does. Or, he is literally a monster that speaks normally. He isn't that much trouble to take down, although his aggressive charge forward is intimidating. Heather wakes up in a quiet version of the hospital, with no Leonard. But, she does have the seal of Metatron. Some believe that the seal can prevent God's awakening, however this doesn't seem to be the case, and this has never been proven to be true. Claudia later claims that the physical seal is nothing more than a talisman, and calls it a piece of junk. Although it is unclear if this is true, or if she was lying to discourage Heather from using it. Heather returns back to the motel in hopes of catching Douglas playing with his nipples. Heather, Heather returns back to the motel in hopes of catching up with Douglas. Instead, she finds Vincent, who claims Douglas left a message, that the church is on the other side of the lake, and that is where Claudia is. Vincent tells Heather to cut through the amusement park to get there. If you're going, you better go through the amusement park. It's probably the only way in now. Heather heads to the amusement park, which is easy to navigate, as it is identical to her nightmare at the start of the game. Even the events are the same here, as Heather heads to the tracks of the mountain coaster ride, but this time she jumps off the tracks before she gets hit. I might sound like I'm moaning here, but I do wish there was a bit more to the amusement park. 
That is the explorer in me that just wants to fight on a bunch of other rides though. I just felt something could be added this time around aside from the souvenir shop. There's a cutscene with Claudia and Douglas as they argue about Heather. Claudia says that the god is within her and she just needs to find her true self so that she can usher in paradise. Douglas says her idea of paradise sounds boring and raises his gun before declaring that he's already killed someone before. Heather wakes up and explores the Borley Haunted Mansion, which has a few scares and creepy moments. I did enjoy this Haunted Mansion bit and found that the narration was quite amusing, especially when Danny appears. That's Danny. Heather finds Douglas after the mansion as he is slumped over and hurt. She says she will go on without him. Heather then finds his notes on her investigation, which gives some good insight into a third person perspective on Heather, which suggests that her dad was caught in a murder case 12 years ago. It also says that the name Heather is a fake alias, and they don't know what her real name is. There's another diary entry nearby from Harry, which explains more about his experience and confusion in fully accepting his new daughter after his previous daughter Cheryl was lost in Silent Hill. There is then an epic fight on the merry-go-round with Memory of Alyssa. This is by far my favourite fight in the game, as it serves as a climactic moment that delves into the psychological and supernatural elements of the game. It showcases Heather's strength and determination to confront her past and unravel the mystery surrounding her identity. The battle itself is intense and challenging, requiring strategic thinking and precise timing to evade the boss's attacks while dealing damage. After the fight, Heather moves on to the nearby chapel. In the chapel, Heather encounters Claudia, who keeps calling her Alyssa. She urges that Alyssa is her real identity, and with that, she can usher in an eternity of bliss. Heather then plays on this by pretending that she is Alyssa, and says that she no longer wants God's salvation, before breaking out Claudia's confusion and calling her a witch. Heather begins to hurt, and we anticipate another passing out episode like she's had before but it's actually just a stomach pain. Claudia says, God is growing within you before leaving. Within the chapel is a confessional where Heather can hear a woman begging for forgiveness for killing a girl who killed the woman's daughter. The identity of the woman is unknown and Heather can choose to forgive her or not. This confessional scene shows that not every choice is the right one. Forgiving the woman or not will contradict Heather's actions and vengeance towards Claudia. Within the chapel's otherworld, we experience the absolute hell of Alyssa's tormented mind, with memories of her life in the Order, school, and hospital. There is blood, flesh, and rust, and rot everywhere. You will find blood bags, wheelchairs, and voltios crawling around. There's two hanging schoolgirls, Alyssa's old sick room, Harry's bedroom, all representing Alyssa and Heather. There is also a belfry which contains a portrait of Saint Alessa Gillespie, Mother of God and Daughter of God. This reinforces reincarnation as Heather is essentially looking at herself as a baby and her past self as the mother. Heather finds Vincent in the library of this other world who delivers this incredible line. Are you talking about the monsters? Monsters? They look like monsters to you? <gasps> Don't worry, it's just a joke. He then celebrates that Heather has the seal and gives her a book on the Otherworld laws. This book says that the seal will bring results regardless of whether the target is good or evil. Its strength, therefore, places a very high burden on the caster, as it is also difficult to control. It is not usually used. There are lots of books and memos on Alyssa and Heather's past which just reinforce what we think happened in the meantime and grant Heather some acceptance for her identity confusion. From her dad giving her another memo reflecting on his previous, a new daughter, to Alyssa's school desk, and Cheryl's old drawing book. Heather eventually encounters Claudia and Vincent, who are arguing in the Sanctum area. Claudia stabs Vincent and then thanks Heather, who she is still calling Alyssa for nurturing God with all the hate in her heart. Heather tries using the seal, which doesn't do anything. Claudia then kills Vincent for good. We all hate Claudia. Yes, she's a victim of the Order too, but she seems too far gone. Heather then collapses and her stomach pains return. This time, her skin is also transforming. 
Now, I sort of wish that this transformation to her skin would happen at certain moments throughout the game. I know Heather has her pains, but it would have been interesting to see this god infecting her at crucial moments of the story. Anyways, Heather shrugs off this birth and consumes Agliophotus. This is a secret substance found in her necklace pendant given to her by her dad, which allows her to throw up this god fetus that is ruling her existence. She is nearly here. Claudia then eats the fetus, she f***ing eats the twitchy thing, and of course she then begins to transform instead, as she approaches this hole on the floor within the sanctum. She's then freakishly pulled in by a voltiol. then follows is the game's final battle, with a boss called God, in this flesh-like tomb with Claudia's clothes on the floor. It would have been cool to see some voltials within the fight, but it's a cool fight nonetheless. When God is defeated, Heather finally has a moment to reflect on her life and her actual identity by remembering her dad and properly grieving over the fact that he is now gone, even after she has had her revenge. <laughs> The game concludes with Hera's charming teenage wit as she finds Douglas back at the amusement park. Is it really over? Not yet. You're still alive. Heather. What the? What? Heather. What? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just a joke. She also tells Douglas that she doesn't want to be called Heather anymore, and she accepts her real name, the name her dad wanted to call her, Cheryl Mason. We then see Cheryl at her dad's gravestone as the game concludes. Silent Hill 3 offers a captivating and dark story that is widely regarded as one of the strengths of the game. Heather's journey is filled with psychological twists and turns as she encounters disturbing creatures and navigates through the twisted otherworld manifestations of Silent Hill. The game effectively builds tension and unease through its atmospheric visuals, sound design and environmental storytelling. It is truly a fantastic story to experience. We are now going to take a look at particular parts of the game outside of its story, including the menus, combat, sound design and more. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the main menu of the game, but I do just want to highlight the consistent subtle resemblance to key themes of each of the games within their title screens. Silent Hill 1 shows a silhouette in the distance behind fog and other obstacles from the town. What's out of reach is eventually lost, and loss is the focus fear of this title. Silent Hill 2 shows water with subtle cool tones. Whilst this does reference one of the possible endings, in water, it may also demonstrate James's mental state of drowning in his emotions. Emotional flooding is a term used to describe the experience of being overwhelmed when strong emotions take over, producing an influx of psychological sensations. This experience may lead to panic attacks, anxiety, or illusions. This title's main focus is on James's mental state, and so this imagery feels appropriate. 
So what does this mean for Silent Hill 3 then? Well, this main menu can illustrate trauma that's definitely more physical than psychological. Also, particular loading screens and imagery like the Game Over screen display this weird leathery flesh texture. Most of the menus seem really internal, if you know what I mean, like they kind of seem really skinny and humany and people-y. The options menu is pretty standard with a familiar Silent Hill user interface and extra options menu. We won't be playing around with these for too long, but changing the blood to green and having bullet multipliers does sound interesting. What's more interesting, however, is the extra costume option which appears after beating the game. This presents a rusty typewriter where you can unlock some fun extras like new shirts for Heather or Douglas in his boxers. Not only does this game have the best unlockables of the series in my opinion, but the way that it's integrated into the main menu with this typewriter appearance is just a fun way to engage people into using the unlockables or finding out what these codes may be. Within the actual game itself, we have our standard inventory screen, which players of the previous titles will recognise for its digital and simple style. They have also organised the inventory screen. Things are now labelled on the left under items, weapons and other stuff. And this is something that was needed in the first two games, so I'm really glad that they've added it here. Our health is represented through the colour overlay on the image in the top left. Green being good, red being bad, you know, the typical traffic-like system. By the way, if you do complete the game on hard action level, you can unlock and enable this life and stamina bar, which is really useful. The maps in the game are standard and don't take too long to understand at all, but I especially like the Central Square Mall map and the Church Drawing map, which is pretty charming yet creepy in an environment like this. Save screens are presented through bright red symbols called the Halo of the Sun. And quite like in Silent Hill 2, interacting with this symbol turns everything red and we have our protagonist staring right at us as we create or overwrite saves. There's only so much that I can say about the UI and menus, but I do appreciate its simplicity and how organised things feel compared to the previous titles. Despite the skin texture on some of the screens, these menus are sort of comforting. They're not overwhelming and so it feels like you can actually decompress during these pause or loading moments while still having some nerves. In this segment, we're going to take a look at the weapons of Silent Hill 3. First, the melee weapons. The pocket knife. This is your basic knife, which I think they kind of give you so you feel like you have something to whack an enemy with. The steel pipe something you can actually whack an enemy with, and do a bit more damage than the knife. The Maul, a very powerful and cool looking weapon which does do decent damage to a variety of enemies, but it is a bit heavy for Heather to carry or swing. The Katana, a very effective and fun weapon to use. Heather does the classic swings and stabs that you can expect from a katana, and feels like the monsters will simply be sliced through its sharp blade. The stun gun. Given to Heather by her father, the stun gun is meh for self-defense. It doesn't really do much damage and can only be used from an extremely close range. Now let's take a look at the firearms. First up, the handgun. Silent Hill 3's standard handgun looks similar to the Beretta 92FS, as does the handgun in Silent Hill 2. It's good at a medium range and keeps enemies stumped, especially at 5 to 10 shots when they begin to drop. The shotgun, a classic crowd favourite, returns as the large shotgun, similar to the Remington Model 870, can absolutely blast most enemies to death. It holds up to six shells and has a rather wide blast area, so if you're backed into a corner or just need an enemy down for good, this is a good pick. The Submachine Gun, the first ever fully automatic weapon to appear in the Silent Hill series. This submachine gun has a good range, inflicts good damage and can carry up to 32 rounds of ammunition. Now let's take a look at some of the other items that you can acquire. The body armour is simple body armour to protect Heather against most attacks, except it does weigh her down. The suppressor, which muffles a gun's blast but reduces its damage. Perfume, which can be used to attract enemies to your location. 
the Beef Jerky, which can be used to distract various monsters including the Doublehead, Numbody and Slurper. Now onto the exciting, unlockable weapons that we have. The Unlimited Machine Gun, an absolute powerhouse of firearm here as you don't have to reload and can simply spray this machine gun forever. The Beam Saber, my personal favourite weapon which is this cool ass light beam. Unfortunately we can't change the colour of it, but it does do decent damage and it looks rather cool. <laughs> The Flamethrower, another cool weapon is the Flamethrower which you can actually make stronger by achieving a 10 star ranking after it's unlocked. The Gold and Silver Pipes, the Gold Pipe is a flashier version of the Steel Pipe, unfortunately it's not any stronger though. The Heather Beam and Sexy Beam, to unlock this you must kill 333 monsters cumulative. Once unlocked you will have it from the start of your next playthrough. To use the Heather Beam, you must unequip all weapons and press the fighting stats and investigation buttons as if you were going to use a firearm or melee. The damage it does seems to be based off your stamina, so if you're tired you won't be able to use the attack for long. And if you use the transform costume, the Heather Beam will be turned into the Sexy Beam. So those are all of the weapons of Silent Hill 3. What do I think of it? Well, although there is a lot of weapons to choose from once you have them all, I couldn't help but feel like something was missing. Look, I know Heather isn't meant to be a weaponry master, and weapons should be basic for the most part, but once I had unlocked everything I felt like there was no happy medium weapon. I either had melee weapons that just weren't the best, or the unlimited machine gun or heather beam which is just extreme. You could suggest that the shotgun is my happy medium weapon, but is that really it? And I think the problem with this is that after 20 years games have expanded and now offer weapon wheels with every category of weapon known to man and variations within each, and so to go back to Silent Hill 3 released in 2003, the change is noticeable. Again, I know she isn't meant to have a range of artillery, but just a happy medium weapon felt missing in most cases. I briefly touched on the unlockables within the weapon section with the unlimited machine gun, beam saber, flamethrower, pipes, heavy beam and sexy beam, but what else is there? Well to preface this segment I want to highlight how unlockables are applied. Once the player meets a specific criterion, like beating the story at least once, they can enter a respective code which will grant them one of the many costumes of the game. So I mentioned that the heavy beam can turn into the sexy beam by using the transform costume. This particular costume can be applied by typing in Princess Heart into the typewriter once the player completes an extra new game. Other costumes, requirements and their codes are as follows. Heather Shirt is unlocked by completing the game at least once and entering Happy Birthday. The God of Thunder costume is unlocked by completing Extreme Level X difficulty and entering Gangster Girl. The Golden Rooster costume is unlocked by achieving a 10 star ranking and entering cock a doodle doo the Royal Flush costume is quite a creative one to unlock, and you actually have to follow a puzzle within the chapel library to get this, and the code you want to use is 01030811112. The Blockhead costume is unlocked by killing less than 10 enemies. The code says, put here to feel joy. The Transients costume is unlocked by completing all riddle difficulties, and the code for that is Shogumuju? That? The Don't Touch costume is unlocked by finding in a magazine in the hospital women's locker room and entering the code Touch My Heart. The Light costume was found on the Silent Hill 3 website and the code for this is Light to Future. The Killer Rabbit costume is found in an official Brady Games Guide and the code is Blue Robbie Win. The Zipper costume is also found in an official Brady Games Guide and the code for that is Shut Your Mouth. The Onsen costume is found within the Famitsu magazine and the code for that is I Love You. The following costumes and codes uh, are only applicable for the PlayStation 2, so any versions other than that you will not see these costumes. This costume is found here, 
a French cable network, and the code for this is Suspense. The EGM shirt is found on Electronic Gaming Monthly Magazine, and the code is EGM. That one. The Game Informer shirt is in the Game Informer Magazine, code Game Informer. Game Pro shirt found in the Game Pro Magazine, code Pro Tip. The Game Reactor shirt is found in the Game Reactor Magazine, the code is SH3 Westlarn. The GMR shirt is found in the GMR Magazine, the code is GMR Owns Jew. The OPM shirt is found in the official US PlayStation magazine and the code is SH3 Opium. The Play shirt is found in the Play magazine and the code is Slim <laughs> The PSM shirt is found in the PlayStation magazine and the code is Badical. The IGN shirt is found on IGN.com and the code is IGN Pickleboy. Game Spy shirt is found on GameSpy.com and the code is I am L33T. The GN shirt is found on GME Network. An Italian cable network, and the code is I wanna be a G J. I wanna be a G J. The OPS2 shirt is found in the official UK PlayStation 2 magazine with the code Extra Thumbs. The PS2 RO shirt is found in the PlayStation Revista official magazine, and the code for that is Matador. Wow. Okay, that's a lot of costumes. If you stuck with me for reading that, then please comment. Well done for reading so good. I would really appreciate it. See, I love this method of unlocking costumes, especially the exclusive PS2 costumes. Do I feel like something's missing? Nope. I genuinely feel like there are so many shirts and choices here, it would be rude not to be happy with this selection. See, why don't games these days have this many alternate outfits for the main protagonist? It seems like such a good way to interact with a magazine website or post or anything just to get the player a bit more involved and get something in return for their player. It seems like such a win and I love how this is involved in Silent Hill 3. Now, obviously, I have to mention the final unlockable costume, which is for Douglas. So to unlock Douglas in his boxers, yes, you've heard that right. Uh, you must beat the game at least once, and highlight extra new game from the main menu. From there, you need to enter the following sequence of up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, circle, X. You will then hear this noise. Oh. This is your confirmation that Douglas has taken off his trousers. This is an examination video after all, but there isn't really too much for me to say about the costumes in this game. Apart from suggesting that this is one of the many ways the developers decided to have fun, and as a player, I felt like this is a great way to reap the benefits of them having fun. Seeing these costumes, having a variety, just something different, some message, a way for me to interact with the game, seeing Douglas in his boxers, it is all just a laugh, and it's a reminder to me that this is a game. And I feel like so many games try and take that realistic approach in every element that they sometimes miss the trick with this. And they forget to remind you that you're here to have fun after all. And it was really nice to have this option in Silent Hill 3. I couldn't finish the unlockable section without acknowledging the UFO ending. This is the fun ending of the game which continues the running joke of UFOs in Silent Hill. I love this brash ending and I'm happy to see this joke return in Silent Hill 3. Silent Hill 3 is known for its unsettling atmosphere and psychological horror. The game's soundscape, masterfully crafted by composer Akira Yamaoka, plays a pivotal role in intensifying the game's narrative and unnerving ambience. Yamaoka's approach fuses diverse musical genres, unconventional instrument choices, and evocative sound design, creating a haunting sonic landscape unique to the Silent Hill franchise. One of the defining features of Silent Hill 3's soundtrack is its thematic cohesion. Yamaoka expertly weaves recurring motifs throughout the game, enhancing the sense of connection between characters and environments. Themes like You're Not Here and Letter from the Lost Days are prime examples, illustrating the emotional depth and raw vulnerability experienced by Heather. So now what should I do? I'm strung out, addicted to you. My body aches, now that you can't, my soul. Silent Hill 3 blends elements of industrial and ambient music, contributing to the unsettling atmosphere. Yamaoka's innovative use of dissonant sounds, industrial noises, and distorted guitars create a sense of unease and impending danger. Notable tracks like Walk on Vanity Ruins and End of a Small Sanctuary exemplify this unique fusion, capturing the nightmarish essence of the game. Blah, nah, nah, nah. Blah, nah, nah, nah. 
Amidst the darkness, Silent Hill 3 offers moments of haunting beauty for its melancholic melodies. Pieces such as A Stray Child and I Want Love showcase Yamaoka's ability to evoke complex emotions using ethereal vocals, delicate piano melodies, and introspective lyrics. These tracks infuse the game with a poignant sense of longing and sorrow, resonated with players long after the game is over. And beyond the melodic compositions, Silent Hill 3 also employs ambient soundscapes to immerse players in its nightmarish realm. These eerie atmospheres featuring distant whispers, unsettling drones and unnerving environmental noises heighten the feeling of psychological dread and foreboding. The tracks Rain of Brass Petals and Memory of the Waters exemplify Yamaoka's mastery of ambient sound design, enveloping players in a world of surreal nightmares. <laughs> As we conclude this segment of music and sounds in Silent Hill 3, we're reminded of the profound impact a well-crafted soundtrack can have on our gaming experiences. Akira Yamaoka's genius shines through the seamless integration of diverse music styles, haunting melodies, and chilling ambient textures. Together, they elevate Silent Hill 3 into an unforgettable auditory journey, etching its mark in video game history. And this has been achieved in every Silent Hill Yamaoka's been a part of, to put it simply, the music in this game absolutely f***ing rocks. It is one of the best soundtracks of all video games in my opinion. More importantly though, this soundtrack still stands strong 20 years later, which for a video game I feel is really impressive. If you haven't had the chance to just sit down and listen through the original soundtrack of this game just by yourself without playing the game, I highly, highly suggest you do so. And just for anyone curious of what my favourite title is on the original soundtrack, it has to be track 14, Never Forgive Me, Never Forget Me. I think if you're aware of Silent Hill, you're probably also aware of this particular track. It perfectly encapsulates the sense of being in Silent Hill, in a simple two minute track. <laughs> In this segment, we'll be looking at the controls and general interactions of Silent Hill 3. This contains a brief look into the movements, combat, puzzles and inventory interactions. Silent Hill 3 utilises a third-person perspective, which allows players to see Heather but also focus on where she is looking. Players can move Heather using the analogue stick or directional buttons. The controls generally allow for basic movement in all directions, including running, walking and strafing. Heather can interact with various objects in the environment, such as doors, items and puzzles. Heather can, at times, feel very linear and clunky as she moves and bumps into objects, and in a chase, I never felt 100% confident in being able to just run away because of smacking into walls and bins, but I feel like that might be a me problem. As for the combat, Silent Hill 3 features combat mechanics with a range of weapons including melee weapons and firearms that we've discussed previously players can perform basic attacks, dodge and aim at enemies using the targeting system. Combat encounters are often tense and require careful management of resources. This game's combat system isn't too surprising and I found it to be much smoother than its predecessors, although at first it does feel rather stiff, which you definitely don't want in a fight, and this is where I found heavier weapons came into use. After some time, I did get used to the combat system. 
Like other entries in Silent Hill, Silent Hill 3 incorporates puzzle solving elements. Players need to explore the environment, collect items and use them to solve puzzles that unlock progression to new areas. The puzzles vary in difficulty and often contribute to the game's atmospheric and immersive experience, as does the inventory management. Players have an inventory system to manage items they collect throughout the game, similar to Silent Hill 1 and 2. The inventory is nicely segmented, unlike the previous titles however, which is greatly appreciated. This inventory system is easy to get the hang of, and it's also useful to check on Heather's health status in the corner. The control scheme for Silent Hill 3 itself is not necessarily unique compared to other third-person games of its time, but the overall experience and immersion set it apart from many other horror titles. Opinions on the control scheme can vary from person to person. Some players find the controls in Silent Hill 3 to be responsive and well suited for the gameplay, while others may have a different preference or find them slightly clunky. It's worth noting that the game was released almost two decades ago, so the controls might not feel as refined as more modern games. Ultimately, the control scheme and player movements in Silent Hill 3 contribute to the overall experience of the game, enhancing its horror atmosphere and immersing the players in its dark and eerie world. Now we have looked at Silent Hill 3 in its entirety, I want to address my initial question of this video. How does this game hold up 20 years after its release? Silent Hill 3 is widely regarded as a strong entry in the Silent Hill series, and a compelling survival horror game. It maintains the atmospheric and psychological horror elements that the franchise is known for, whilst introducing a new protagonist and building upon the lore established in the original Silent Hill game. The game explores themes of identity, trauma, and the cyclical nature of suffering. It weaves a complex narrative that connects to the events of the first game and delves deeper into the lore of the town and its supernatural forces. The story is well crafted and provides a satisfying continuation of the Silent Hill mythos, building upon established themes and expanded the series lore. Silent Hill 3 successfully ties into the broader Silent Hill universe by exploring the consequences and lingering effects of the events of the first game. It expands on the town's mythology, offering new perspectives and revelations whilst maintaining consistency with what's already established. The game features connections to characters and locations from the original Silent Hill, providing a sense of continuity and rewarding longtime fans of the series. This game excels in creating a haunting and unsettling atmosphere. The game is renowned for its atmospheric visuals, sound design and environmental storytelling. It retains the survival horror gameplay mechanics of its predecessors. Players navigate through both the real world and the nightmarish other world, solving puzzles and engaging in combat. The level design is intricate and well crafted, with a mix of exploration, combat encounters and atmospheric set pieces. The game strikes a balance between tension building exploration and intense combat sequences. Silent Hill 3 is widely considered a standout entry in the series, often regarded as one of the best Silent Hill games. Its story, atmosphere and gameplay have left a lasting impact on the survival horror genre. The game is celebrated for its strong narrative, memorable characters and its ability to deliver psychological horror and emotional depth. So in conclusion, Silent Hill 3 does hold up as an excellent game even 20 years after its release in my opinion. Its engaging story, atmospheric design and psychological horror elements make it a worthy addition to the Silent Hill series. It continues to be appreciated by fans of the franchise and the survival horror genre as a whole, showcasing the lasting impact and quality of its storytelling and gameplay. Thank you for making it this far into the video. If you enjoyed your time here, how about watching another? Or even better, how about clicking subscribe?